Well, good afternoon, folks, and welcome back to the farm. As you can see, it's still a winter wonderland here. It's not the first snowfall of the year we've had, but it is the first one that stuck around for more than six hours. So I figured, well, what better time to get myself a homemade haircut than right now, hey? I might as, I might as well begin as I mean to proceed and just be cold and frostbitten for the next six months. Anyhow, I really can't complain. Actually, it is, it is starting to warm up here now. It's gotta be on the top side of zero. I can hear off the top of the shop roof. Things are starting to melt down and it's filling our no-fill water trough right off the eaves trough there. That's fantastic. Don't have to fill that thing all winter long. Just the black roof. The black roof is, is all it takes for the sun to hit that thing. Melts all the water, keeps the water trough full. The new barn we're gonna build is gonna be the same color scheme as this. Blue on black or black on blue, however that works. So very excited about that. Eventually we'll probably try and do something similar there. Just tie in, uh, tie in a water trough. We'll see, we might actually have to dig, might actually have to dig one in. Now, as you guys know, well, maybe you don't know because some of you may be just new to the channel. Maybe you're only in there the first few episodes. You didn't realize this, but we came out of, well, what was most definitely the worst drought combined with the most extreme heat wave I've ever experienced in my 40 years on this, on this earth. And uh, we really limited on grazing space, pasture, regrowth of grass. So you can see we've got some electric netting set up here just that temporary step-in fence post stuff. <laughs> I got the rams in here grazing. This is really just a spot. You know, there's there's some trees, some saplings and stuff that we're trying to grow in here. That's the neighbor's fence. And then there's this kind of this just dead, unused space here. It's not really dead. It's, it's a living space. But the grass grows and I've got to mow it. And if i got to manage it, but I'm also short on feed, it makes sense for me to be able to run a couple animals in here and have them do it. So we set up this... Uh, portable sheep netting here that we got from PV Mart. I think it was $249 per roll. The roll is 164 feet long. So we've got two strung out from the edge of the ram pen all the way to the fence south of here. And they're basically just grazing around the trees in this, this area of grass. But with the snow we got yesterday, it was very wet and sticky. And you can see, you know, it just kind of clung to the fence. It's putting an awful lot of weight on the fence. So I figured I better come out and at least shake the fence off because if all that snow load gets on there, eventually it's gonna pull it down, pull it down, pull it down until these fellas can just walk right over top. So this isn't really a good solution for winter time, but we're not truly in winter yet. We're just, uh, just in the precursor to winter. Ugh. And I figure, because there's still grass sticking up through here. The snow that's fallen is light enough that these gentlemen can paw through that. Same with the ewes down at the bottom. You can still see there's lots of grass sticking up there. So we'll let them, we'll let them continue to forage and graze in this spot right here. Same with the ewes, they can stay down there. If we get in excess of another three inches, I gotta hit the stop button because it's gonna to get to a point where they will pack it down. They won't be able to paw through it. And well, they're just gonna to have to come up on hay. The grass that's left is pretty scrubby, pretty dry. It's providing them with roughage, but it's not providing with a lot of energy. It's not providing with a lot of protein. And so that's why we have both the rams and the ewes on molasses as a supplement. So it's a 28% molasses sheep supplement we get from Bloom Enterprises. It's on a, it's in a lick tank and they technically get all the nutrition they need from that. But the thing is in order for a sheep's rumen to work, they also need the roughage. And so that's why they can clean up the scrubby grass and stuff like that. And they'll all be triple happy teddy bears. So you can see they find no problem at all finding grazable grass down there. But yeah, if it gets to be, if it gets to be four to six inches deep, I certainly wouldn't want to have to shovel for my supper, and I don't think they would either. As you can see a spot like this underneath the snow. There's still lots, of, a little bit of clover and alfalfa in here. It's still actually nice and green. So I think they'll do all right for a while yet. And really what I'm hoping to stretch out is, I mean, if the weather's going to do funny things, the best I can hope is it's going to do funny things to my advantage. If I can't feed them all summer long because there's no grass, all I can hope is to keep them on what's left of the grass 
until it's time to bring them up for breeding. And the reason I want to wait until it's time to bring them up for breeding is because we run two distinct breeding flocks. Now, all summer long, the ewes congregate together. They raise their lambs together, one big happy family. But when they come in to see the boys, they got to be split up into two groups. So it'd be really easy for me to run the ewes up into the corrals, split them in the alleyway, and then just load each distinct flock in and put them in their own appropriate pen with their ram. It's just less juggling to have to do really. So right? our automatic water bucket here, as you can see, I already dumped it out. I had a little bit of a crust on it this morning, but it refilled the garden hose isn't frozen solid. So that's a good sign. Long range forecast, I say long range, it's like the next 10 to 14 days is looking like, well, I probably only got about seven to 10 days left until that is just not gonna get above zero during the day. And so the garden hoses will have to get wrapped up. And hey, just before, uh, before I get carried away here, you can see our young ram there, right there, using that molasses slick tank, getting his treats in. That's exactly what I'm talking about. All the nutrients they need to survive are in that stuff. They just need the roughage to be able to process it. So that's fantastic stuff, absolutely fantastic. Anyways, water, yes, seven to 10, seven to 10 days. We're gonna have to wrap that up. And I've got the, uh, the no freeze chicken waterers prepped. So we've got a, a power outlet right here on the back of the one chicken house. And I just run an extension cord and it sits on this block here. And it's basically a conventional vacuum style waterer with heat trace wrapped around it and insulation wrapped around it. And it'll just sit there and it'll stay defrosted until minus 17, minus 18, somewhere thereabouts. And then I got to start thinking about transitioning it into the chicken house. I generally don't like to put it in the chicken house simply because water, a source of water inside the chicken house can create excess humidity. You need a little bit of humidity in there to make the deep litter work, but excess humidity makes a lot of ammonia, makes a lot of stink, makes for some unhealthy chickens. So it worked really, really well last winter because we had an exceptionally mild winter. And the thing sat out on that pedestal all winter long with the exception of about, I don't know, it wasn't much, maybe, maybe two or three weeks all winter long where we had some really cold dips in February and we got down to like minus 50. But that wasn't the norm, that was, that was kind of the exception. And speaking of birds in winter, just looking out over the lake there with the snow we had, <laughs> the lake, the surface of the lake actually crusted right over. So I can hear the geese honking this morning and I'm sure they're not very happy about being where they are right now. And it's time for them to start going a little further south. The girls in the chicken house, however, are nice and cozy on their deep litter. In fact, this little bit of snowfall that we've had is really the first introduction of any humidity or moisture into the chicken coop this season. And that's really what's gonna get that deep litter activated and actually starting to work and generate heat. Because remember, you need three sides to get your compost pile working, right? You need carbon, nitrogen, and a little bit of moisture. What I'm gonna do here, just to show you guys just how hot the compost pile in the chicken house gets with the deep litter method, is later this winter, once things are really steaming along, I'm gonna get a few chicken eggs and actually tuck them inside the compost pile. I'm gonna leave them there for a couple hours. Hey, boys, get along. And I'll come back and crack it, and you will see that I can cook a hard-boiled egg inside the compost pile. Now, of course, last year's experiment, I showed that we got to 160 degrees Fahrenheit, which means I could actually have cooked a ham inside the compost pile. And well, I could lose a couple eggs. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna forfeit an entire ham to the compost pile. So this is gonna be a throwaway thing after it. Anyways, I just wanna show you for the purpose of science, I guess, that it is possible to do. Anyways, for now, it's probably time for me to think about getting some supper, maybe some ham for myself. So I'll let you go for now. I hope you have a fantastic evening and we'll see you tomorrow.